Hello, I'm Coach Bigham. I am the spring coach of the United States Army Physical Fitness School. The video you're about to take a look at is on the high and low bar squat. It's going to give you an opportunity to learn how to coach your tactical athletes properly in those two uh, skill sets. This video is going to also give you an opportunity from a coach to be able to enhance your ability from a technology standpoint. It will go over uh, the iPad and you were sent a program we like to use here at the Physical Fitness School to allow us to be able to coach our tactical athletes proficiently. Enjoy the video. So again, we're going to talk through the squat, high bar squat. Anybody know how to demonstrate the high bar squat to me? I got a volunteer that can demonstrate the high bar squat. Anybody? No? Go ahead, let's jump on in. We're going to demonstrate the high bar squat. You just go ahead and take it off a couple of steps and do the squat. Come back up. Everybody pay attention and see what they see. Just, just do two reps. Okay, rack it back. Appreciate how they look. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> We're going to talk about a few things that allow us to be a little bit more proficient at the squat, okay? One thing we want to understand the difference is from a high bar squat to a low bar squat, what do you think there's a major difference is? Okay, high bar squat is going to ride where on my back? Up on the traps. It's going to be up high. High bar, low bar, it's going to ride on the back of supraspinatus or the rear delt. So it's going to drop approximately two, maybe three inches based on Obviously, your biomechanics and how the length of your back is, okay? But typically, which one do you think we can carry more weight? The high or the low? The low. We got the high. The low. The low. Why do we think the low carries more weight? Center of gravity. It's right. It brings the bar closer to center mass, okay? And it allows us to have a better lever arm because our lever arm is our femur. That's essentially where we're going to do all our hip flexion and hip extension, okay? We have Sergeant Barter come up now. He's going to start to set up for the high bar. First thing and foremost we want to talk about on the high bar setup is, is the bar height. Okay, the bar height, whether you're doing a high bar or a low bar squat, should be set up along approximately the mid sternum line. Okay, that's where the bar should go. Why do we think we want to go to that position? Because so we can unwrap the bar safely. Does everybody set theirs that height? Where do most people set their bar height? A little higher. Okay. When you're using light weight, it's not that big a deal. You can kind of manipulate it, walk out, and understand the handling. But when you're carrying weight close to your max, if it's a little high and you start to have to go up on a tippy toe or start to have to go a little unbalanced, it's going to cause you to be unstable. Okay, so we want to try to make sure, again, sternum height, that's first and foremost, is the height we always want to set our bar. So when you go approach it, make sure you get that set. All right, he's got it set his sternum. He's going to go with high bar setup. High bar setup is going to be a closed grip. Not a suicide grip. It's going to be a closed grip on a high bar because high bar is more unstable on the track. There's nothing really holding it minus your hands. As he secures the bar, what we want to be able to do is ensure we have zero impingement. So if he rotates his wrist under, we've got impingement already starting to happen. Who's had tendonitis before in the elbow or in the wrist? It's typically because we're trying to carry too much weight on the wrist. We want to carry the weight approximately 90 to 95% of the weight needs to stay on the back. So we have to clear our wrists, clear our elbows. We don't want the elbow underneath, okay? Once we do that, it allows us to retract our shoulder blades a little bit, which gives us a better platform to hold the weight and suspend ourselves in the position to be able to handle a little bit heavier load. He's gonna go ahead and step out. He's gonna rotate 90 degrees, just for demonstration purpose from the side. And again, elbows clear. We're resting the bar on the trap. Now, we want to talk head placement. Where do we think our head and eyes need to be? Who thinks straight up? No. What about, what about 100 mile an hour stair? Like straight out? That's, that's close. That's close where we want to be, but we want to actually have just a slight tilt, kind of looking three to six feet out in front. Why do you think we want to have a slight tilt? Less stress on the neck. Less stress on the neck, what else? Strains up your spine. Yeah, strains your spine up, because watch what happens if he bends his head back. His thoracic cavity has a tendency to start to collapse. Mm -hmm. He's not really light right now. If it was really heavy, he would expose himself more. 
So again, he's going to have a slight three, six feet look out in front. From there, he's now going to be able to, to start to focus on the squat. Where does the squat start? Hips. Yes. Hips are the first thing to move. Most amateur squatters are going to start with their knees first. That's just the way we're taught a lot of times as a child, and that's the worst way to squat. Most stable position is our pelvic girdle, and we've got our largest muscle. What muscles are attached to our pelvic girdle? Quadriceps, hamstrings, glutes. Our core and TBA is all tied into our transverse abdominis. So all those muscles are going to control this area to give us a good base. So he's going to leave his hip, he's going to pop the hip back, and then from there he's going to sit down to a squat. Do a couple reps. As we go to sit back in the squat, we want to make sure it lighter weight that is apparent. As a coach, we've got to be able to see that he leaves or she leaves with the hip. If we don't see that, we've already failed at the squat. That's the first and foremost piece. Does everybody notice it is apparent? He leaves with his uh, hip every set or every rep. If you don't do that, you're going to put yourself in a position to start to have knee trouble. Now, let's start talking about the knees. As we're doing reps, what does the knees need to do? As he starts to drop in his descent or his eccentric movement, what does his knees need to do? His femur. It bends, but it needs to externally rotate. Okay? He's going to externally rotate. He's going to push the leg out. The leg's got to externally rotate out. That allows us to generate torque in the pelvic girdle. If it does not rotate out, it starts to collapse in. And we become unstable. It's like we're essentially pinching a medicine ball and it makes it too much pressure on our ankle and the inside of our knees. Who's had problems with their knees before squatting? Okay, typically a lot of times it runs in females. We have a little bit larger uh, hip base, uh, which is understandable. So you really have to work diligently to make sure you externally rotate the femur. Those are the two major pieces, is the hip flexion and extension and is external rotation of the femur to ensure the knee stays over top of the toe or in line with the foot. Okay, now let's talk about our feet placement real quick. Are you, you good? Okay, feet placement. If you notice, he's got a little bit of supination he's turned out. Does everybody notice that? Okay, why do we think we do that? Balance. Balance, what else? Rotation. rotation. Helps the rotation. That's what we're looking for, promote rotation. Again, it's based on the biomechanics of the tactical athlete. If the athlete has really good range of motion in the pelvic girdle, they might not need to turn out as much. But what's recommended is between 5 and 20 degrees that you can rotate. And again, it's based on the soldier. That wherever that soldier is, they need to kind of play around with that to determine. And my uh, coaches are going to show you on the sled, when you do single leg squats on it, it's going to be able to allow you to determine where that angle is that's more consistent. Because we want to ensure we keep the heel in contact. <coughs> you notice one thing I didn't really talk a lot about is heel contact, did why do you think, who's ever heard that in the gym? Everybody always talk about drive from the heel. Why do you think we say that, uh, Sergeant Mayo? Um, you get the strength from your quads. Well, you get the strength mainly from your hamstrings when, when you go to your, uh, allow yourself to drive off the calcaneus or the heel. But understand, heel drive is great. It's not the number one priority. Okay? It's one of those secondary or third aspects that you might want to correct. Remember, midfoot is the most athletic, most athletic position that you can ever be in. Because if I tell you to run and move to the side, you're not going to move on your heels. You're going to move on your feet. So if you ever get in a little bit of unbalanced position, you're going to have more of a tendency to start to lean slightly forward. It's where we want to be for an athletic stance and our heels are off the bank, off the ground. Okay? I'm not saying heel drive is not important. That is something that's important, but if, if the soldier does not have flexion and extension of the hip does not have external rotation of the femur, then these two need to be fixed first. Once those are fixed, then let's start talking about some things about the heel maybe slightly coming off a little too much and we're getting too much forward lean. We can then kind of focus on that to get it set in a better position. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions on the high bar squat? Go ahead and wrap the weight back. I got a question, sir. In regards to like when you, when you start to rotate the knees out, a lot of times like I used to do a lot of like crossfit squats and front squats. 
a lot of people like they said like you know feet shoulder width and then often like you, then you pretty much turn your hips like you open up your hip girdle you rotate your knees out and then you initiate the squat which would you recommend you rather like lead with the hips first and then and then focus on bending down or just kind of rotate and then just lead i down. would always recommend first to get the pelvic girdle properly right with the flexion and extension okay. if we get that right we can kind of get those in sync a little bit better but i understand with lighter weights you can't promote like body weight squats, things of that nature, maybe with kettlebells, small weight, you can't promote a little bit of external rotation. I just don't want to get false satisfaction that we end up being in the knees first. Because if we lead with the knees first, we'll have a tendency to not allow us to fully engage the pelvic girdle properly. So we end up unstable. Good question, though. Sorry. Any other questions? No questions? What we're going to do is I'm going to show you just one other way of setting up a high bar squat, grab your straps. He's just going to take some basic wrist straps. Again, we have a lot of times uh, soldiers in our organization have shoulder injuries. They have some impingement in the shoulders. They can't get the arms back in here uh, comfortable from that standpoint. So he's going to show you a little modified way. Show everybody how bad it is. Oh, you can't? Okay. <laughs> yeah. But he's going to go ahead and set up. And all he's going to do is essentially put the strap on. So you walk around and just kind of show them. So again, all we do is just slide the straps on. We're going to put it in the front. We typically like to recommend to the soldiers to start off with relatively lightweight so they get understanding uh, this basic setup. And he's just going to go ahead from there, secure the straps, place the bar in the high bar position, and step out and go ahead and do squats. From there, his elbows you see are really relaxed now. There's no tension in the system. He's really relaxed. Go ahead and squat on your own. And he can continue to squat. Now, can you carry your max weight that way? No. Uh, you can probably carry up to about 80% once you train uh, and allow yourself to feel comfortable with that technique. But what do we think it promotes even more there with regards to our pelvic girdle? More balance, more course is being activated because, again, the weight is free now. It has a tendency to move a little more because we're holding tension on the straps. Not only does it free our elbows, and it frees our shoulders, but it allows us to be able to activate the core a little more. So again, it's just another way to add a, uh, an additional system exercise to go ahead and wrap it back. Any questions on high bar squats with an accessory type exercise, uh, assistance to it, i.e. Uh, wrist straps? If you notice, I don't know if some of you came in, you see my road bar over there. It's got the safety pads on it. It's the same setup. Does everybody see that? It's on that other squat rack over there. It's got the pads on it, comes around, and you can hold it there. When we get ready to squat here in a little bit, everybody can kind of go over and touch that and then do a couple sets that way and see how that operates. Any other questions on the high bar squat? All right, we're going to transition to the low bar squat. The only thing different on the low bar squat, we're going to go ahead and set up, it's going to be the placement of the bar. That's going to be the first change. Second change is going to be where we put our head nice. Before we was having it, what was our uh, focal point? Three six. Three six feet out. Once we go to the low bar squat, our focus points now is going to literally be right over our feet, three to six inches out. Okay, that's the big difference on the, that. Let's go ahead and set up. First and foremost, the only thing we're going to change is we're going to move the bar down. So if you notice, our high bar was here, and then we move our low bar down to where we make our natural crease. So when we take our shoulder blades and squeeze them together, our rear delt kind of rises a little bit. And if you don't really have a lot of musculature there, it's still going to have the bone that runs across that way, and you still got some soft tissue then to let you carry the bar. That makes us a nice platform, a lot more stable than the high bar squat. From there, our hand placement, all the only difference is instead of going with thumb around, we go suicide grip. So we go thumbless grip. We essentially pinch three or four fingers on the end on the bar because, again, the weight is suspended here. We free our wrist. From impingement, our elbows out. We're still in that same position. He's going to unrack it and walk out. Then I'm going to have to rotate all the way around 180. Again, he's going to do a few squats. Just go ahead and do about three or four squats. Head and eyes are going to be like right here. Everything else looks the same, don't it? Other than that, he has a little bit more forward lean. Does everybody notice he's got a little more forward lean on the torso? It should increase about one to three degrees. But the key thing that we're looking for from a coaching standpoint is the bar pass still stays on in line with the feet. It doesn't come in front of the feet. So we still got the same line 
of movement with the bar path, which ensure, ensures that we're stable. Now, a while ago we didn't talk about our breathing. We're going to talk briefly about our breathing. Breathing is going to be the same pretty much with every exercise we do, but it's really critical in the squat. When do we take our breath in? Right before you squat. Before you go down. Okay, right before we squat. That's correct. We want to essentially make a false belt. That's what we're trying to do. If we go ahead and take a big, deep breath, extend our thoracic cavity, allow our stomach to feel from the diaphragm, we can essentially stabilize this entire area. Okay, he's going to squat from there. When do we release the air? Yeah. When he gets probably around the sticking point coming up. You don't want it right at the bottom. Where would our sticking point be in the squat? Right at the level. Right, just slightly above the level position. So that would be your sticking point. That would be where you start to release a little bit of air as you start to move through that concentric uh, part of the exercise. Has anybody got any questions on the high bar or low bar squat before we break off in groups and actually get some practice with you? I just have a question, sir, just for, for the knowledge of myself. When you, when you get to that sticking point, you start to release that breath slowly. What is the actual purpose of releasing that breath like super slow as you, this is almost like diving when you get the bed, it's kind of like your oxygen level. What it actually does, it makes it easier for the pelvic girdle to move forward. So pretty much you're slowly relieving some of that tension. You're relieving some of that tension, okay. and that's why if you do it a little too soon within the squat, you can end up missing one to three percent okay. of where your max would be. So let's just say, hey, I'm doing 300 pound squat, and I release a little early, I might only could get 290 that day instead of getting that 300, that extra 10 to 15 pounds on top of that squat. But it's, it's timing, everybody's is a little bit different. It's not precise to say, I can tell you 100%, everybody has to do it at this angle but it's plus or minus one to three degrees where the hip is in relation to standing up is where you want to start to release it. Does that make a little bit better sense? Yes, sir. Okay, what other questions we got? No questions? And what we're gonna do is, we've got uh, three of us out here. We've got three squat racks. We're gonna go ahead and break up into three groups. We're gonna get on a squat bar. We're gonna practice setting up, taking it out. We're gonna put <coughs> the high bar first. Then we're gonna work into the low bar. Okay, one of my, my instructors will do is, we're gonna still check your body weight squat, and we're gonna check your basic goblet squats. Everybody done that? Everybody done a goblet squat before? All it is is essentially a kettlebell turned upside down. We're just gonna check you range of motion. Okay, we wanna see if, if you already having trouble with just your body weight to go all the way down. Because again, our goal is to be able to take the squat to the full end range of motion. And the reason we wanna do that is we incorporate the stretch reflex. Anybody heard that term before? Just so you know, if you do the stretch reflex, you do it every day. Every time you go to jump, you do the stretch reflex. Because if I jump and I lock my knees, I can't jump count. So essentially what I do when I go into flexion and, and spring, that's the stretch reflex. I'm making tension in the hamstring, kind of like a rubber band effect, and it allows me to jump. Okay, it allows me now to be more ballistically, and that's what we're trying to incorporate in the squat. By breaking parallel a little bit, we incorporate a little bit of a ballistic movement to get out of the hole. Okay, so it gives us ability to move more weight, essentially, through range of motion. All right, the safety squat bar is another opportunity that you can exercise to utilize and maximize uh, squatting with a soldier that potentially has a shoulder injury. Go ahead and do a couple reps thus far, Martin. As you notice, the weight is being suspended on the traps and across the delts, so it is not on the wrist nor elbows. All right, go ahead and rotate for me, Sergeant Martin. Again, this gives you a better perspective to see where the support is. Go ahead and give me a couple reps. Okay, relax. I can talk for a while, but I'm going to stop, okay? <laughs> I, enjoy, I enjoy all this uh, squatting. We're going to go ahead now and break up into uh, two groups, and uh, let's go ahead and practice our high bar and low bar squats. <clears throat> Again, always focus on the primary areas first. 
the pelvic girdle, the knees, and then kind of look at the feet placement and the head placement. Because feet and knees kind of, uh, feet and a head kind of go pretty pretty close together. I didn't hear his breathe though. Did you? Were you exhaling? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's purple. So let's look first and see if we get good flexion and extension. Oh, look at that form. Just kidding. <laughs> Does everybody see us about simultaneously? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're from slightly ahead, but your still knees starting to be in at the same time. Does everybody see that when you slow it down? I would have never known that's such a big thing that your knees going first. Yeah. It's such a, a bad a bad thing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing he's doing is lumbar and the rectus spinous. Does everybody see his tilt's really bad at the top? He's very he goes too far back. Oh, okay. Which is all right. When it's lightweight and you're going to try to teach and promote that, it's fine. Okay, as long as you're not doing so heavy I'm weight. Exaggerating trying to do it. my hip. You're saying? exaggerating just a little oh, okay. too far back, and it's putting it's probably you. Probably because I'm, I'm just trying to prevent my knees from moving. Okay, far. which, like I said, that's fine. What is the normal range of motion for your hips? Saying you're going too far. How far? Top Anytime line. you start to see the lumbar spine start to collapse, if you notice his collapses. See how it starts to make a bad C? Oh, before mm -hmm. I go down. Right there? Yeah. If once it makes that C, when he started to go down, he went too far. Okay. So, so everybody's a little different. A little yeah, yeah, everybody's a little different, but it's just a little motion. Okay. It's just depending on, uh, obviously, your biomechanics and your makeup is going to determine how much you're going to actually extend it back. Right. Okay, let's, let's, let's see if we can take a look at a little bit of the feet work this time on his. It looks like they're almost. Does everybody see him come off? Uh, yeah. Okay, so he's, he's, remember I told you it's fine, but what we want to talk and look at now is our knee placement. Okay? Knee placement should never go in front of the front foot. Okay. It's in front of the front foot. Okay. And it's when it's, it's really hurting him when he's getting his feet off the ground in the back. See how much further he goes forward? Mm -hmm. So that can end up causing some knee injuries and potentially cause more back pain because he's, he's essentially allowed his hamstrings to turn off. Your hamstrings become very soft when the knee gets above and the heel comes off. So it does not stabilize the pelvic girdle, which in turn does not stabilize the lumbar on the spine, which in turn is a carry up. So now you start to rock forward, okay? But that would be the big thing if I was looking at <clears throat> his squat from the bottom is his knees are going beyond forward of his front toe. Okay, so he might have to just turn open a little more. He might have some impingement in the hip, or he might have some impingement on Achilles tendon with the solus. Anybody know what the solus is? It's the other muscle in the calf. Yep, other muscle that's deep underneath the gastroc. That muscle, these muscles might be really tight, or your pelvic girdle might be really tight. So I would give him a few exercises to loosen those areas up and then have him squat again and see if the heel starts to stay in more contact. Any questions on that? How do we think that look? What were some things that we maybe noticed as a coach from a coaching perspective? Because you got to remember, we got to understand how to do the technique. We got to understand how to coach too. That's the main thing we're trying to learn here in this course, so we can coach our tactical athletes. I'm so not sure if I leave with my pelvic as good as I probably should. Okay. That's one thing I can definitely feel. Okay. Maybe didn't feel like he was uh, leading with that. With a, Anybody else see anything that might have been wrong? I think if he kick his feet out a little more, he'd be more stable because I see he's okay. like bopping a bit. But one thing we noticed is you see he already gave a correction. We want to identify the problem first. You say it's rocking. So you see the thing, we identify the problem, then we determine how we're going to fix it. So it's good you can come up with a problem, recommended solution to the problem. What else? Have you seen anything else? It seemed a little fast. Pace. Maybe a little fast? Yeah. Maybe okay. if we slow it down, we can identify it. Okay, well, that's what we're going to do right here. <laughs> that's what I was waiting on somebody to say. Coach, you got the answer right there. Let's slow it down and look at it. Okay, so just understand when you're a coach, if you've got an iPhone, you've got whatever you can use, iPad, use that. Try not to make too much assessment and feedback while they're doing it because they're not going to be able to correct some of that. Remember, we always identify the most major deficiency. That's the one we work on and we try to fix. We don't try to fix all of them. You know what I mean? Because everybody might have four or five things wrong. Right. And then what's up happening is they don't fix one of them. But if we can focus on that one deficiency, that's going to allow us to be a little more proficient. So let's go take a look.
All right, see, and I can slow this down now. Okay, and I want you to take a look and let's see which one we think is moving first. The knee is, the knee is going yeah. first. See how easy it is to tell that when I use just something like a quick app to allow me to be able to do that? Now, I'm gonna allow him to uh, come down and we're gonna look at some bar path. So we're looking, we want about a 45 on the back so it'd be nice and flat. We're looking for a good 45 on the hamstrings when we get ready to go into our scent. We're wanting the bar path to kind of stay within those lines. Does everybody see that? If I was to follow the lines up, it's going to allow us to go up and down within that period. But if you look at here, if you watch and I pause from here, he kind of comes in and out with the bar path. He goes forward and back. So does everybody see that? That might have been the wobble you was talking about, him leaning forward and back. But again, if I was going to fix one thing, What's your name? Uh, Sorry, Gary. From Sorry, Gary would be his hip flexion, hip extension. As a coach, I'd say, let's work that. Okay, as we talk to technology, what we're gonna look at is here's uh, UberSense. You have a free and a paid uh, option. We're gonna look at the free version of UberSense. It's gonna give us an opportunity to be able to analyze our soldiers from a technical standpoint. I have uh, a, a video that I'm gonna go ahead and break down for you. As you see, it gives you an opportunity to manipulate uh, and analyze the squad or any, any uh, tactical movement and be able to enhance that ability. You have multiple options, as you see on the right-hand side, to give you the opportunity to be able to draw and enhance your ability to coach. I'm going to draw a couple of lines here when you're looking at the squat. Some of the squat lines we're looking here is we, we should have 45 degree angle on the hamstrings with the knee. We should have approximately 45 degree angle on the upper back and the upper extremity. Uh, one thing that we should also be able to look at is the knee should not go in front of the front toe. And then we should look at bar path. Our bar path should stay pretty much straight uh, throughout its entire range of motion from the eccentric to the concentric movement. So as I move through this, you'll be able to get an opportunity to take a look at this. As you see on the left-hand side, you can slow down or speed up uh, your movement. I'm going to go down here to the uh, one eight and allow you to be able to see the bar path is moving forward. Uh, it's not within those lines. Hamstrings never go to a 45-degree angle. And as you, she moves up, I'm going to uh, manipulate a little bit of the bar path and allow you to see as we zoom in to take a look at the heel and the heel itself is coming off the ground as you can see as I manipulate and she's also doing a valgus collapse. Her knee is going towards her midline which is not safe and is allowing the bar path to move too much. Uh, so as you can see here, it gives us an opportunity to be able to zoom, analyze, and track every minute detail on the squat. So I'll allow this to continue to run through a couple reps so it gives you a chance to see. The most outlying aspects with uh, her squat that's standing out in this one is she does not lead completely with the hip into her flexion and she has a little bit of uh, impingement in her lower extremity as in reference to her heel coming off the ground. I'll speed this back up and be able to run it at full range. And if you notice the bar path is going anywhere from four, two to four inches forward. And again, this application will allow you to be able to enhance your ability as a coach to be able to break down again those primary cues and determine what their deficiencies are. So now not only you, but the soldier gets to see those and in, uh, in time correct those deficiencies.